Now, some have asked on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday morning, uh, why we would have communion, why we would have the Lord's table, the elements of the Passover. And, and one of my responses uh, was, why would you not? Because uh, really, when you think about the Passover Seder, and we did, we've done it here and had several occasions, uh, as always do during the, the season, w- what, is, what is obvious and apparent is while, while the, the crucifixion of Jesus, the redemptive work of Jesus, is front and center in the Passover observance and Passover Seder, we, we sure get that, don't we? And we'll be reminded of that again this morning. It's all about a greater redemption, and Jesus raised the stakes and broadened our understanding, the, the Passover Passover was a, was a historic lesson of something temporal in the past. But it, as the book of Hebrews says, uh, the Old Testament scripture and all the sacrifices and even the Passover, it's just a shadow compared to its ultimate fulfillment in, in Jesus. And so we understand, we get from the hindsight of Jesus teaching that the Passover points to a redemption that's not physical, not land-based but a redemption that involves the, the removal, the purging, the washing forever of all of our sin and, and the forgiveness of sin, cleansing and, and being given spiritual life, new life, regeneration, rede- all, all that God does in restoring us, reconciling us to a relationship with himself, that's sure clear in the Passover Seder. But what also becomes clear as we note in the celebration of the Afikomen, that distinctive place, remember when Jesus took the matzah, the unleavened bread, and, 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 and the afikomen, meaning I have come, or the one who has, has come, the, the peace that was, that was hidden, broken and, and, and hidden, and, and then retrieved for a reward. What a powerful statement of the risen Jesus enacted in every Jewish home in Passover season done Friday night and again last night and the first two nights of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, those first two nights particularly reenacting the Passover. I've been interacting on Facebook with some of my unsaved Jewish friends because they've been wishing each other happy Passover. Some of them were my high school um, uh, student friends and I've mentioned we're a part of, I'm a part of this group. It's the 50th anniversary of my high school graduation here this fall. And, and so we're part of this big, uh, big group and communicating, interacting. Oh, there's a good number of Jewish folks in, in that area of Union, New Jersey back then. And, and a, lot of it, a lot of Passover greetings and, and wishing each other. And so I decided to throw it out there because somebody mentioned something about the Afi Komen. So I, I, I threw out there this question in the discussions and saying, I wonder, does anybody have any clue what the ceremony of the Afikomen really means? What does it mean that the broken piece of matzah, the hidden, the middle piece of the, of the matzah tosh and wrapping is broken and then rewrapped in white linen and hidden house and then later uh, afterwards retrieved for reward? Anybody have any idea what this means? And I got a couple of takers Mostly ignorers, which doesn't surprise me. A couple of takers just kind of had the, the, the cutesy response of saying, it's a way to keep the kids under control. And I understood what he was saying because parents will bribe the kids because the first part of the Savior, of the, the Seder, the first part of the Passover Seder is typically in all Jewish homes very long. And honestly, a lot longer than what I typically do. Most of them go for about two hours before you get to eat. And so his response, I understood culturally, was you keep the kids quiet in there because the, 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 the message was, if you're not good while we do this, you're not getting dessert later, retrieving later. And so he had that snide remark. And, and it, it, it was honest and, and genuine. And, and I responded to him saying, <clears throat> well, I, I get it, it's kind of cutesy and all that stuff, but don't you think in a ceremony filled with so many solemn symbols, I mean, designed to produce tears in us, that there must be something much deeper, much more significant, much more important than just something kind of trite about, you know, keep the kids quiet so you can have dessert? 
Uh, th- th- there weren't a whole lot of other takers because, frankly, they have no clue. Some of the, some of the rabbis atta- uh, attach a, a spiritual meaning suggesting that the, the retrieving of the matzah is a lesson that God has for Israel something important in store in the future, that the nation will be resurrected, that the nation will have the promise of the covenant. And I thought, that's at least you're coming on to something that has some meat to it. So I give them credit, at least for that. But then we delve further. Our point is to, is to acknowledge that when Jesus took that broken piece, the afikomen, and likened it to himself, it's my life, it's my body, the great exchange has been made, I'm the perfect one, I'm the, the one without, without chumets, without crumbs, without leaven, without any kind of sin, I'm the perfect one who was broken for you, died for you, but I, I rose for you. I mean, man, what a powerful lesson, even symbolically in the Passover Seder. The resurrection of Jesus. It is absolutely the central theme of Scripture. It's a central theme in all the Gospels. All four of them end there. It's, it's like the encore performance after the crucifixion when everybody's sad and hearts are let down. And, and then he's arisen from the dead. And wow, what an impact upon the apostles and disciples as the resurrection appearances are cited at the end of all four of the Gospels. What a change. What a change in mood, a change in scene, a change in hope, a change in everything about us from despair and hopelessness. It all is transformative. And then you go to the book of Acts, and man, it's the central theme, isn't it? Of all the preaching after Jesus rose from the dead, from Peter on, it's all about the resurrection. And what a response that produced, especially in, in, his, in, the, in the Jewish audience. It's the common theme of all of the New Testament, New Testament letters. I, I thought it appropriate, at least from Peter's uh, preaching, just to read a couple of verses that are, that are symptomatic of his constant preaching. In Acts chapter 2, his first sermon, as he's challenging the Jewish audience in Jerusalem, you remember these words in Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 22? Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. That's a stopping point. Last night we were out to dinner somewhere and there was a conversation going on rather loud between some people who like to have themselves heard. And one of the points of discussion was about was about uh, Jesus rising from the dead and, and, and Jesus being crucified. And one of the guys asked somebody else, who killed Jesus? I knew what they, where they were going. You know, was, it, was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? Uh, and, and I wanted to, to interject into the conversation. I probably should have, but I didn't. The answer is right there. Who killed Jesus? Who was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus? Well, he was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. It was part of God's eternal plan. He knew it from the beginning. It was ordained from the beginning. It was God's plan, God's doing, Jesus submitting to it, the Spirit of God engaged in it because he rose him from the dead. I mean, it was God responsible. That's That's the starting place. And Peter preached that, that message while you rejected him. You nailed him to the, to the cross, the hands of godless men. You put him to death. It was God's plan. But Acts 2.24, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And the entire sermon of Peter centers upon the risen Jesus. Even David prophesying it, one text after another from the Old Covenant, it's all about the predetermined plan of God, all the way through the book of Acts, all the way through the letters, and here no less in the book of Romans. And while we've been expositionally going through the text uh, section by section, this is something maybe we haven't done topically, just to look at the resurrection alone and, and note its constant reappearance thematically 
and what it teaches. So let's do a quick overview. And I have for you five points about the resurrection of Jesus that Paul makes through these letters. The outline is right there uh, uh, in, in, your, uh, in your program, in your bulletin. And, and here's point number, number one. What does the resurrection prove? Number one, the, the resurrection proves that he, Jesus, is almighty God. That's a starting place. So let's go back to Romans chapter 1 where we read together a few moments ago and notice the statement that Paul makes about who Jesus is as a consequence of the empty tomb in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul is making a description in the introduction to the book to the believers at Rome about Jesus, the Son of God, a descendant of the line of David, which had to be for him to be the Messiah. But notice the declaration that's announced in verse 4. This Jesus, the Son of David, messianic fulfillment, the Son of God, divine nature, all of that stated in verse 3. He's not just human, he's divine. The statement concerning him of verse 4, he is declared to be the Son of God. Divine essence, divine attributes, divine character. We've talked about this many times. The term Son of God has nothing to do with a place of origin or beginning, has nothing to do with the beginning of existence. The term in Hebrew theology, when you're announced as the son of, it's the way of saying, this is your essence, this is your DNA, these are your attributes, this is who you are. When Jesus is announced as the Son of God, it has nothing to do with the birthplace. It has to do with who He is. It is His divine origin, His DNA. He carries the same attributes, the same character traits, the same essence as God the Father. He is God. He is declared, Romans 1, 4. And what a powerful word Paul uses in that verse. The word declared is most frequently used of something that is verbally spoken. We think of of an announcement. We think of preaching or teaching as something that that is declaring, proclaiming, heralding important truth. In that culture, Greek orators were were commonplace in the marketplace, sharing ideas in Alexandria and elsewhere throughout the Roman Empire. It just was a carryover of the Greek culture. And there were many who were philosophizing or declaring truths they believed to be um, important. And Paul uses this kind of terminology, certainly to the believers in Rome, in the seat of the capital of the empire, where you had many like in Alexandria and Egypt, these kinds of uh, stations where people would gather and philosophize and ponder and postulate these profound statements. And so they would be declaring, loudly announcing. It's fascinating that what Paul is describing uh, in, in terminology that is especially verbal in nature. I mean, it could be written, but it's primarily used for verbal declaration. Paul's using an act, an event, as if it is speaking. Notice it doesn't say he is declared by a sermon or declared by what he said, but he is announced to be Almighty God with power, with authority, divine authority. There is a verbal announcement and declaration that Jesus is absolutely God, an announcement that carries all of the authority of heaven. And the announcement is made not by something that is said, but something that was done. Wow. You heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, here's an event that's worth tens of thousands of words. An event so critical it becomes that focal point in all the Gospels and the history of the book of Acts and, and all the New Testament, certainly here in the book of Romans as well. There is this declaration of the deity of Jesus with authority of power by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus conquering the tomb, the stone being rolled away, the grave clothes that were neatly wrapped on the side. All that gives 
gives attention to his divine authority. I mean, even the statement of the, the grave clothes becomes important. I was interacting with someone uh, asking questions online about, about what, what, what that meant. And man, there is a statement of Jesus' absolute divinity. Because remember, the, the Jewish religious leaders were concerned that Jesus' body might be stolen in order to... Uh, to supposedly find a way to talk about him rising from the dead. And so they had extra guards. Even they were expecting and knew that something was awry. They were just trying to blame it on something else, try to hopefully find the body. Never could, never could. But the fact that when, when the, the, the ladies and the disciples first bent down and looked into the tomb and, and they saw the the, the grave clothes neatly wrapped and even the headpiece separately neatly wrapped and lied down. Man, that statement by itself was powerful because if there was someone or someone's prone to try to create a plot and steal the body of Jesus, several things would have happened differently. One, they likely would have taken the body as it was wrapped because of ease of transportation. They would never have unwrapped it. They would have taken the whole thing as is and get out of town. Second, if they were prone to do something like that and have unwrapped all of the the linen wrappings, would they have nicely, unless they were a little OCD, let's just fold this so nice and neat and leave it, oh, we don't want to disturb the... They would, have, they would have unwrapped this, cut this thing up. Throw, it would have been all over the place. Remarkable. Lazarus, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, you know the problem he had when he came out? He's all wrapped up. That's, you're all wrapped up, man. He's all wrapped up. He had, Jesus had to give instructions. And men, this wasn't a simple process to unwrap. To go through that whole... Jesus didn't need to be unwrapped. Jesus didn't need any human assistance. He was able, I I suppose, when he rose from the dead in the tomb, since we saw him later kind of in a resurrection body, kind of passing through walls, I suppose when he rose from the dead, he just passed through his wrappings. And, And the headpiece and the body piece were always separate. He just wrapped that baby up nice and, you know, laid it down over here in the headpiece and laid it down over here in sayonara. Out of here. Man, there is a loud proclamation that is announced. The resurrection of Jesus screams, I am almighty God. And it silences all of the accusers. That announcement. The last words of Romans 1, 4. I am God, our Savior, Jesus. I am the Mashiach, the anointed one, the sent one from the heavens with eternal origins. Remember how he ticked off the rabbis in John chapter 8, the end of the chapter, when he announced those solemn words that are only assigned to God himself. God gave that identity to Moses when Moses was called. Remember that I am? Man, that really shook up the troops. How dare you? How dare you take for yourself a title that is ascribed only to God for yourself? Well, hello, guys. That's who I am. Yeah. And, and here it is. Jesus, by the empty tomb, he is announced as our Savior, Yahashua, God our Savior, He is announced as Mashiach, Messiah, the anointed one who comes from his eternal dwelling place in the heavens. And he is announced to be Kurios, Lord, God, Sovereign, Absolute. So what does the resurrection declare? Well, proves who he is. The Apostle Paul uh, pounded that theme home over and over again. One place in particular of many to draw attention to is his prayer on behalf of the believers in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, he he is praying for the believers there as he's also praying for us. 
and, and praying in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19 that we would grasp the surpassing greatness of His power, endunamai, explosive dynamic power, toward us or for us who believe in Him. And then he describes that power and authority that he would like for us to grasp. That power, the middle of verse 19 of Ephesians 1, are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him, when God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. God wants us to get the fact that Jesus is absolutely divine. With divine nature, divine character, divine essence, divine authority, divine power. Far above, far above, far above all authority. Unthreatened, unchallenged. We look around us and we wonder, man, how is God going to get this done? The same way he's always gotten it done. He's Lord. He's creator, ordainer, sustainer, establisher. It's who he is. That's why Jesus could say, I will build my church. He's the creator. He's the builder. He's the sustainer. He's the keeper. He's the progressor. He's the one who completed all. So of all the lessons to learn about the resurrection of Jesus, this is perhaps most important. What does it prove? It proves he is absolutely almighty God. Aren't you thankful? Secondly, the resurrection provides an answer for the sin problem, the sin dilemma. I mean, it's a major dilemma all the way through Scripture. The Jews had to contend with the statement of Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Ezekiel, the prophet, who who announced to the people of Israel, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. All the way through Scripture, there is the constant reminder of the effects of sin, and all the Israelites ever had to do was to look at each other and see the dramatic effects of rebellion because they lived it out for generation upon generation, hundreds of years. The dilemma of dealing with their own rebellion, their own hostility, their own rejection of God as their divine establisher and creator. They modeled fallenness. In spite of all of the warnings of the prophets over and over and over again, it was all about sin. Isaiah faced that on behalf of the people in his vision of the glorious, uh, majestic Lord as he required cleansing. Daniel, at the time of captivity, as he's praying to the Lord at the end, acknowledging since he's part of the nation, even though in heart and spirit he wasn't a participant of their defiled rebellion against God's authority in their lives, he acknowledged that their sin was in part his. He used the the, the pronoun, it's our sin, it's we have done. It's a problem, isn't it? Book of Romans all over the place. Romans 3.23, all have sinned in the context Jew and Gentile. All peoples, all races, all nationalities, all religious groups, you name it, claim it, we all share in that same nature. The whole section, we we went through it laboriously. Chapter 1, verse 18 through chapter 3 and verse 20. The wretchedness of our depravity and sinfulness as a disease. Sin infects infects every part of our makeup, every part of our being. We are completely consumed by that which condemns us. It doesn't mean that we are as evil as we can possibly be, but all of us is polluted. And so the quotes from the Old Testament that we went over over, over and over again, Romans 3 and, and verse 9 and following, there is none righteous, not even one. None who does good, no one who seeks after good, none of us understand. And, and over and over again, like a bazooka, boom, 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 one after the other. The resurrection ultimately provides the answer to the dilemma. Romans chapter 10 and... Verse 9, we we read the text as we began earlier this morning. And and the context, remember, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are especially in context a gospel presentation to his Jewish audience. 
Remember those three chapters are all about Israel as a nation. What about them? Jews who were believing in Jesus would have had lots of questions. Man, if, if it's true that Jesus took my place as the Passover lamb and he died for me and he, and he rose for me, if it's true that if I place my faith in Jesus, I have forgiveness of sin and he creates spiritual life in me and he's living inside of me. If all that's true, any Jew of the time frame would have been asking themselves, well, what about Israel? I, I don't get it. What about the covenant? What about the promises? What about all the promises of the future? And those three chapters address it with great clarity, concluding with with God's great plan for Israel's future that he will fulfill because it's about God's faithfulness, not our unfaithfulness. I mean, listen, just like God's going to fulfill his promise to present you before his throne, faultless and without blame, it's about him, not about us. Aren't you thankful? It's his faithfulness, not my unfaithfulness. It's his sinlessness, not my sinfulness. It's all about him. It's all about the cross and the the empty tomb. And and Jews are asking the question, what about Israel? And and in chapter 11, ultimately, uh, the, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God will restore the nation as promised to and through the prophets. But here in chapter 10 becomes a personal gospel invitation uniquely to unbelieving Jews by application to everyone. And we're familiar with it. Romans 10 verse 9. If you confess, the word means to agree with God. If you will come to a place bowing before him, acknowledging before God that Jesus is who God says he was, and Jesus did what God said he would do, if you'd simply own it and acknowledge it, in repentance, claim it for truth for you. If you would acknowledge not only with your mouth, but life, when you confess it with your mouth, it was an evidence in Jewish culture that you were speaking that which was already transformational in the heart. I'm simply giving words to what I believe and know to be the truth. If you would confess with your mouth, Literally in the Greek, the word as, that's usually in italics in most English translations, it's not there. It's inserted to try to provide some readability in the English. Literally, it might read, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord. Jesus, God. If you would come to that acknowledgement, the absolute authority and deity of Jesus, and you come to that, Because, verse 9, believing in your heart, that's the seedbed where transformation spiritually has to occur, right? The convincing of the mind and the transformation of the heart. It's not external. It's not by law keeping. It's not my doing. It's it's not my obedience. It's not my righteousness. It's not me being better me. It's a transformation of the heart. Believing in my heart that God raised me him from the dead. You notice the text says nothing about the crucifixion? Ever, does that ever bother you? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and that he rose from the dead, you'll be saved. You notice it says nothing about the crucifixion. It only speaks about the resurrection. Listen, in the context, that makes absolute sense. Because the Jewish audience there, they all knew Jesus died. They, that wasn't an issue to be debated. All of them knew it was contextually within the time frame. They all knew about the historical event that Jesus lived. They knew about his miracles. They knew what he claimed to be of himself. And they knew he was crucified. And they knew the religious leaders were kind of partly responsible for that, as well as, as, well as Roman authorities through Pilate. They understood the historical truth of the life, the death, and the burial of Jesus. They knew that. The big issue for the Sadducees and religious leaders was whether or not he literally rose from the dead or whether they did something to the body. And so the issue really was for them, not whether or not Jesus historically died, but the issue is whether or not he rose from the dead. Because if he did, the reason why he died, well, that becomes a no-brainer. See, that's the key issue. It's absolutely critical. 
If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that very conviction and belief rooted in the heart would be a consequence of knowing that he is my Passover lamb. He paid that price for me. He took all my sin and all my judgment and all the wrath of God that I deserve because of my lostness and my depravity and my sinfulness. He took my place. I am so thankful he is the one for all sacrifice. He really is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And, and my confidence and assurance comes in knowing that he rose from the dead. If, if you're uncertain about the resurrection, you're uncertain about your sin. If you question the empty tomb, you have every reason to be questioning where you'll spend forever. The evidence of the empty tomb is so profound. Man, the resurrection provides an answer for the sin problem. Aren't you thankful he rose from the dead? It connects us with the very next point. The resurrection provides assurance for salvation. The resurrection not only is a directive to help me understand why Jesus died, and we'll come to that when we come to the Passover elements, but it also gives me a great sense of confidence and assurance, and that's the statement of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. And we've been here before. It is this concluding paragraph of this three-chapter section on sanctification. It is the benefit of Jesus to my life now, not just forever. I mean, it's one thing to enjoy the fact that I'm going to spend forever with him, that I have eternal life. I mean, that's where, that's where chapter 3, middle of the chapter through all of chapter 5 is all about. But 6, 7, and 8 is all about what, what about now? Man, I'm, I'm messing it up now. I'm struggling now. I've got my own sin problems now I wrestle with. And we've been through that, the victory that God's provided for us by the indwelling Spirit of God, Christ in us. All of that's there. So that we'd have the confidence to conclude that in my life, not only am I fighting my own sin, but God's given me a path to victory, but I'm also following the curse of a, a world around me that's messed. I mean, that's, that's the whole part of this eighth chapter beginning at, at verse eight, uh, 18. rather. I consider the sufferings of this present age not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed in us. I mean, this whole long section is all about not only coping with my own sinfulness, but coping with the fact that I'm living in a world that's cursed as well. And it's like everything's against me. Life fights against me. People fight against me. Sickness fights against me. Circumstances fight against me. Persecution and obstacles fight against me. Trials and testings fight against me. Man, it's like I can never get out from under the storm. How am I going to make this? Well, there's supernatural reasons why we, we're conquerors. And that's part of this concluding paragraph in Romans 8, 31 to to 39. God's for us and he did it, demonstrated it when he sent Jesus to die for our sin. But our certainty and confidence and assurance in verse 33 and 34, the rhetorical question in verse 33, who's going to finger point? Who's going to bring a charge? Who's going to point a finger? That's Satan's job. Right? Revelation 12, 10, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the finger pointer. When you and I live under finger pointing, we're li- living under the charge of the enemy, never the, never the finger of Jesus. Jesus may expose his hand to show what he endured for us, but God never points the finger. Who's going who's gonna to bring a, a charge, an accusation, a finger pointing against those who are his when God is the one who has declared us to be righteous in Jesus? The end of verse 33, if God's declared us to be righteous and we're in Jesus, the only finger pointing is to say, look at my son in him or her. Look at those white robes. Look at what I've done to redeem them and to give them the hope and promise of forever. Well, verse 34 takes it a step further, and here's where the resurrection shows up. Who is the one who condemns? That's a little stronger term than accusing. Accusing is, you messed up. Condemning is, you're going to hell because you messed up. Accusing is, you did that. Condemning is saying, you're sentenced as guilty, will be judged forever because you did that. The Greek word katakreno means to judge downward. You're going down to the hole, to the bottom. It's a result of 
I guess the lawyer is successfully prosecuting. Who is the one who can do that? Well, Christ Jesus, remember he's, he's our defender, 1 John chapter 2. Christ Jesus is the one who died, implied took our place, our punishment. The sentence judging downward that you and I deserved, he took in our stead. He took all the finger pointing of all of us. He took all the wrath instead of us. Christ Jesus died, yes, affirmative, absolute. Rather, who was raised. There it is. There's the resurrection. He was raised from the dead and now has ascended at the right hand of God the Father, that place of rule and authority and dominion once again. And he is interceding, praying, mediating for us who believe. The resurrection, followed by the ascension, places him in that location of rule and authority from which he pleads for us. In the context, it sounds to me like I get what he's praying for. Sounds like he's just praying that we get it. He's he's praying we just own it, get it, believe it, live in light of it. See, the resurrection of Jesus becomes my place of resting for absolute confidence and assurance that my sin has been paid for and purged. Without the empty tomb, I'm looking back wondering, I believe he kind of came to be the Passover lamb. I believe he came to be my mediator. I believe he came as the judgment for my sin. How do I know if it worked? How do I know? The empty tomb. That's how I know. See, that, that's what gives me all of the assurance, all of the boldness, all of the confidence of knowing that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be children of God. How do I know I'm connected with him? How do I know I have access to him? How do I know he's still alive, ruling and reigning over my life as Lord or over the church of Jesus Christ? How do I know? Well, he rose. He rose. And he's at the right hand of God, that place of reign and authority. So the resurrection provides not only an answer to sin, but assurance of my salvation. Do you have that confidence? You have that certainty? You have that assurance? That's a bold place to be. You can never get there on your own. But in Jesus, we're there. Number four, resurrection provides for abundant life. For believers in Jesus, the teaching of Romans chapter 6 was radically new. No one would have ever heard this before. It's nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. Maybe some glimpses of transformational life that that David wrote about, like in the, in the 16th Psalm, that will make known to be the, the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. Kind of some inference of, of something different if I know God's mercy to even temporarily forgive me. But man, Romans chapter 6 becomes radical new teaching in all of its detail, and we've been through this in, in, in great, great detail. When I came to place my faith in Jesus, I, I know that he, he came to live inside and, and I know that he transplanted in me a brand new nature and unplugged that brand new nature and God the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me and he came to be transformational so that I can, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Remember the statement? We've been buried with him been ba- through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And now we get the spiritual significance of, tr- of transformational life, of having spiritual life. God not only redeemed me, forgave me, washed me, cleansed me, indwelt me, robed me, gave me the promise of forever, but he gave me in that one moment all of the equipping I could ever need for resurrection living now. It helps me to understand the meaning of believer's baptism. Jesus physically died and and Jesus physically was buried and Jesus physically rose from the dead. 
spiritually, when I came to place my faith in Jesus, spiritually, I have died to sin's dominion and condemning power in my life. I've been buried following in Jesus' footsteps in that spiritual sense, but I've been spiritually raised up by God's indwelling presence so that I am equipped and empowered to now walk in newness of life. When Jesus said in John 10, I've come to give life and give it more abundantly, he wasn't kidding. When Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, we are more than conquerors because of him, or chapter 8, verse 37, we're more than conquerors because of him who has loved us, he wasn't kidding. That conquering capability is provided by new life in Christ. It, it's the reason Romans six eleven and following is there. We can add up the facts of what God did in us and believe that we are dead to sin, to authority, dominion, and mastery over us, but we are alive to God because we're in Jesus Christ and we can make different decisions when we're faced with all those temptations and all those struggles. We have all the equipping and all the empowerment within to ensure that because we're under the grace of God, we have greater power than being mastered by our sinfulness. Jesus, by the empty tomb, provides abundant life. Paul came back to that in Romans chapter 8, verse 10. Since Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. I'm alive in Jesus. Do you know that? It's true for you. Here's the resurrection of Jesus in Romans. It proves he's almighty God. He's the answer to sin. There's assurance of salvation. He provides abundant life. But one last one, Romans 8 and verse 11. The resurrection proclaims that one day you and I will rise from the grave. It's the grand conclusion. It's the great finale. It's the grand crescendo. It's the encore performance. It's the finishing touch to it all. It's the assurance that one day he will present us before his throne faultless and without blame. It's the promise of 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, it hasn't appeared yet what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be with him. We shall see him as he is. It's the truth of Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, if that spirit dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. The spirit of God indwells you, indwells you, indwells you. The Spirit of God that raised physically Jesus from the dead. One day, He will raise the dead who are in Christ. He will raise us as well. We have that promise. It doesn't just end here. There's a forever ending with a forever hope attached to a a forever promise. Romans 8, 17, Since we're His children, we're heirs. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with him. It's going to be completed in the end. Romans 8 and verse 29 and 30. Those that God knew beforehand, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, whom he predestined, those he called, whom he called, those he justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to follow in his footsteps. Jesus is the first fruits, but we're going to follow. Isn't that good news? It's about now and forever. What's the resurrection of Jesus mean to you? Why, yes, it's even proclaimed in the Passover, hidden to some, veiled to many, blinded in sin. It's a picture of of what our condition is outside of of Christ. But he's the unleavened one. He's the perfect one who took upon himself all of our sin, was raised from the dead. You and I, if we've placed our faith in Jesus, it's so much bigger than knowing that he's forgiven me of my sin. Are you thankful for that, that he's forgiven you of your sin? It reminds me of that song we sing at the Passover, Dainu. 
We didn't do it this past time. I did it in the one Thursday night. We, 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 I gave the music to the pianist there. He used to play years ago for us, and, and, and she, she did it. And I, we, we, we kind of sang the thing together at, at the end. And, man, what, what a great dainu. It, it's enough. All the stanzas. If, all, if, for the, if God only delivered us out of slavery and never gave us a land, I couldn't ask him for anything more, dainu. If God only delivered us out of slavery and, and, and even took us through the Red Sea and we never got any place else. Well, for 40 years they wondered if they would. But, <laughs> but if that's all that God did, Dainu, I couldn't complain. If God took us out of bondage and took us through the Red Sea or uh, crossed on dry ground and, and he gave us manna and gave us water while we were there in the hot desert, if he never did anything else, how can I complain, Dainu, it's enough. But then you gave us the land and you gave us the, the Torah and you gave us the law and you gave us... And it's like a rehearsing, statement by statement. You kept giving and kept giving and kept giving and kept giving. Dainu, enough. Wouldn't, wouldn't we be able to say, Dainu, to forgiveness of sin? If that's all we had? And that's Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, how could we ask for anything more? To think when we realize the condemning nature of our sin, to know that God in Christ would look at us, forgive us, wash us, cleanse us, once for all sacrifice. Say of you and me, because I place my faith in Jesus, I have declared you to be forever righteous in Jesus. Doesn't matter what you've done or what you'll do. You're in Jesus. You're wrapped in his white robes. You're forgiven forever. If that's all he ever did, would you and I have any reason to have the chutzpah? Good Yiddish word. The chutzpah to say, I want, I deserve, please more. Oh, God, what, what arrogance. But he keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. And that's what the resurrection's all about. It's not just about what I have now in forgiveness or what I'll have then forever. It's about all this that comes with it. And I'm thankful packaged in this great theological book. Here is a treasure trove of rich truth. That gives us hope both now and forever because of the empty tomb. Are you thankful? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and come. We bow humbly before you for your mercy and grace that is rich and free. All that's ours in Jesus, we thank you. We worship you. You alone are deserving of great praise. Thank you that you have enriched us in Christ, blessed us beyond measure, May we be livers and declares of the empty tomb for all you've done to redeem us, set us free, and give us hope and confidence and victory both now and forever. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.